بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين سيد الأولين والآخرين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to this lecture organized by our brothers in Holland. I wish I could say uh, um, any greeting in, in Deutsch. Though I've been to Holland maybe three or four times in my life, though my sister-in-law is Deutsch and my nieces are Deutsch, though we had a house in Maastricht 40 years ago, Yet, I could not pick the language, unfortunately, due to my ignorance. Nevertheless, I hope you understand my poor English. And I also hope that you benefit from what we are going to discuss. <laughs> Because seriously, I did not prepare a lot. Well, actually, I did not prepare anything. Due to the fact that I know that, inshallah, what I'm going to discuss with you is basic knowledge. The topic, if I understand it, is how to live and deal being a Muslim in the West. And if you look at the Muslims in the West, why are they there? Either they came long time ago searching for a better standard of living, so they were going there to improve their lifestyle and get better job, make money. Or they are there to study and gain knowledge from colleges, universities, and they liked it and they stayed. Or they're there because they're refugees running away from their countries due to it is unbearable to live there or they're being prosecuted or for any other reason. So the community of Muslims that live in the West, they're not all the alike, they're not the same. They have different reasons for being there. So when we want to discuss anything that deals with their standard of living, with the way of life, with practicing Islam, we'll find that this topic is endless. It depends on how you look at it, from which angle are you looking at it. Sometimes people think really, really deep. And sometimes people think on the surface, what to do in the times of wearing niqab or growing a beard or free mixing. That's it. This is what they know or understand about Islam. So it is always essential to go back to the fundamentals. Oh, that's why they call you a fundamentalist. True. Fundamentalist means a person who abides by the fundamentals of his beliefs. And this is why such people are always classified as extremists. So when you abide by your religion, when you abide by Islam to the letter, this doesn't go well with the vast majority of Muslims, let alone with the disbelievers. Imagine, even the Muslims would not accept it. Oh, this is too extreme. What is extreme? Quran and Sunnah? Either you're not a real Muslim or we are the few who are following the footsteps of the Prophet. ﷺ. So it's always essential to go back to the basics because what I'm going to say is not rocket science. Everybody knows it. All the du'at and the shuyukh and the students of knowledge and the scholars, they're not reinventing the wheel. 
They're simply opening your eyes. And due to the fact that you live in a Kafir country, among disbelievers, among Muslims who are sinners or barely Muslims, your brain is being washed and lots of the basics are being compromised till the extent that we have reached the end of time where the Prophet ﷺ told us that evil would become good and good would become evil. This is how people see it nowadays. So let's attempt to explore such venues and open our eyes together. I might be wrong. You have the right to correct me. But if I'm right, then it's about time for you to reflect on your life and to see whether you are on the straight path heading to Jannah, inshallah, or you need to do something about it. Now, why are we created? Sheikh, come on, this is basic. Everybody knows this. Okay, refresh my memory. Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقُتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created the jinn and the humans except with the sole purpose of worshipping me, worshipping Allah. So this is why Allah created you. Okay. Do you acknowledge? Sure. No, no, no. Seriously, do you acknowledge? Do you accept this fact? Yes. This is why I'm praying, I'm fasting, I'm, I'm a Muslim. Akhi, this is not only the forms of worship. Because ibadah is far greater than simply fasting and, um, uh, and praying and giving zakat. Yes, it is one of the pillars of Islam. But is it everything? No. So what is it that you're talking about, Sheikh? Akhi, how many years did the Prophet spend alayhi salatu wasalam in Mecca? 13 years. And after that, he migrated to Medina and stayed there for 10 years. Very good, mashallah. You've done your homework. What did the Prophet wasalam, do in these 13 years in Mecca? Duh. He taught everybody Islam, such as prayer, fasting, hajj, zakat. Wrong. What do you mean wrong? These are the pillars of Islam. Wrong, Akhi, because Salat was ordained and obligated only in the last years of the Mecca period, after the Isra and Mi'raj, the miraculous night journey. And this was one, two, or three years before Hijrah. So for 10 years, there was no Salat. For 13 years, there was no zakat because zakat was obligated in Medina after migration. There was no fasting because fasting was obligated on the second years of hijrah in Medina. There was no hajj and umrah because hajj and umrah was obligated on the tenth on the ninth year of hijrah. Whoa, that's strange. So what did the Prophet do all of these 13 years in Mecca? Uh, he taught them how to worship Allah. Okay, but I thought you said all of these forms of worship were introduced in Medina. Yes, because that was not the only form of worship. What is the first pillar of Islam? To bear witness that there is no God worthy of being worshipped except Allah and that the Prophet Muhammad is his servant and messenger. This is the Shahada also known as the Kalima. This is what the Prophet والسلام, spent all of his years in Mecca, as well as in Medina, teaching the people. Who 
Allah is. What the Prophet والسلام's status in Islam and why should we obey him? Simply manifested and summed up in Tawheed. So the Prophet والسلام, had spent all of his life teaching people Tawheed, the core of Islam. Tawheed al rububiyyah Tawheed al-Uluhiyya, Tawheed al-Asma wa sifat and what to do with the belief that the Prophet is a servant and a messenger of Allah, to obey him in what he orders, to stay away and refrain from what he prohibited, and to believe whatever he told us about, and not to worship Allah unless he legislated it for us. This is worshiping Allah. And with this concept, if you look at the vast majority of Muslims in Europe, in America, not only that, even in Arabia, you will find that they're not actually worshiping Allah Azza wa Jal truly. So what to do then? <coughs> we have to focus on rectifying our direction. Are we on the straight path? Because the vast majority of Muslims pray, fast, give zakat, perform umrah and hajj, but when it comes to the real test, whether they're Muslims or not, whether they give priority to Islam or not, the vast majority fail. And I'll give you an example, although this is not part of our lecture, but as I said, I didn't prepare for it. So who cares? A dear friend and a relative of mine who is practicing, memorizes the Quran, and very good in his moral etiquette. His wife had an accident last week. And it was a minor accident. But she does not have a driver's license. So when the insurance company came, or the police came to investigate, she wrapped it up, took the other car's number and details, and they left. The following day, her husband calls the other party. They meet in the same place where the accident happened and they call the insurance company. The insurance company comes. The husband says, I was driving. Here is my driver's license. And the other party gave his driver's license. The fault was 100% on the woman. So they did not compensate the damages in their car. And they took the report and they left. And he was telling me about it. So I said to him, Subhanallah, you are a practicing Muslim and you memorize the Quran. When it comes to euros and rials and dollars, you tend to forget easily. Isn't this cheating when you cheat the authorities and say that it was you who was driving? Isn't this lying when you sign the papers that you were driving? He said to me, yeah, but uh, it won't cost us anything. They're not going to compensate us. I said, true. But who will compensate the other driver for the damages on his, on his car? He paused for a while and said, my company, my insurance company. And I said, would that have been the case if you registered your wife as a driver I said no they would not give him anything because she's not supposed to be driving on top of that the police would fine us a thousand rials for driving without a driver license so i said subhanallah look how many mistakes and sins you've fallen into 
Why? Because we consider ibadah to be praying, fasting, that's it. And looking like a sheikh with a big beard, that's it. Not the core of ibadah, which is the fear of Allah, which is that the risk is in Allah's hands, which is I don't lie in my hand that says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah in salah, I do not sign anything that is false. This is what real Islam is. And this is what the Prophet taught his companions in Mecca for 13 years, to know who Allah is, to know what Tawheed al-Rububiyyah is. And this is not the time to go and explain Tawheed al-Rububiyyah and al-Uluhiyyah and the Asma and Sufat. There are so many other lectures. And I have, I think, a lecture on my YouTube channel by the name of Tawheed or the types of Tawheed. I did it in the Maldives and I did it in Nigeria and maybe in Malaysia, which explains the types of Tawheed and the implications of it. So give it a shot and, and look at it. So as Muslims living in the West, what are we supposed to do? I can't have the whole night to explain to you what you have to do because this is a very long process and a long topic to discuss in details. But as I said, this is just an eye opener for someone who's old and grumpy grandfather like myself who did not do his research and did not prepare for this lecture because I don't consider it as a lecture. It's just a reminder between brothers and sisters. So th this is just a reminder. So don't take it seriously. It, just listen to it and inshallah we'll be rewarded for it. So what do we do, Sheikh, if we live in the West? First of all, you have to identify that you are Muslims. Okay, everybody knows that. No, not necessarily. Saying I'm a Muslim, but I go to nightclubs and drink beer and fornicate with non-mahram women and cheat like so many Muslims in the Netherlands. I know this for a fact. A lot of the Muslims are Muslims by name, not by true identity. And this is what's tarnishing the reputation of the Muslims in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Europe, and in the whole world. When I say that I am a Muslim Saudi Sheikh, but I do not act like one. If I am arrogant, and I am, sue me. What are you going to do? I'm Saudi. If I'm arrogant, if I'm ignorant, if I'm not considerate, if I don't care about people's feelings, if I lie, if I cheat, if I abuse my wife, if I cheat my neighbors, if I uh, uh, take the money of my workers, and then I say, I'm going for Umrah, inshallah. I'm going for Hajj, inshallah. I am tarnishing the reputation of Islam. So for you as a Muslim living in the West, you have to always remember this beautiful ayah. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Allah says, there is no one better in rhetoric. No one is better when they speak more than those who do the following three things. Number one, make da'wah to Allah. They call people to Islam. Number two, they do good, righteous deeds. So it's not preaching. I could preach you all day long. I have the knowledge. I have the technology. As they say in the $6 million man, gentlemen, we can rebuild him. I can do that. But talking is everybody's game. Allah says, da'a ilallah, make da'wah. Then does righteous deeds. So when you talk, you have to walk the talk. You have to do righteous deeds. You have to offer night prayer. You have to fast voluntary prayers. 
You have to be kind to everyone, not only to your family and relatives and colleagues. Everyone, even the disbelievers, even the Kafirs, you have to be kind to them. You have to be polite. No offensive, vulgar, profanity words coming out of your mouth. You have to lower your gaze. You have to do good deeds. And we can spend all the night talking about good deeds. Thirdly, and to proclaim, I am among the Muslims. What does that mean? It means that you have to preserve your identity. Why is it when I look at you living in Europe, I can't differentiate if you're European or a Muslim? Okay, Sheikh, what do you want me to do? Wear like you, Saudi dress? No, 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 no. Wear trousers. I, when I travel, by the way, and I'm traveling in two weeks' time, inshallah, to Egypt, I wear jeans. I wear a shirt, polo shirt, a t-shirt, depending. And I wear my Nike shoes. But tell me, can anyone mistaken me for an un-Muslim? <laughs> no way. You look at my trousers, it's above the ankles. You look at my beard, wow. This guy is, maybe he's Sikh. Maybe he's, I don't know. Yeah, but you know, look at my mustache, you know he's a Muslim, definitely. So my identity is crystal clear. I'm a Muslim. And you don't find me walking with a beer in my hand or a whiskey or looking around at beautiful women, flirting with them. You find me lowering my gaze, minding my own business, occupying myself, doing halal things, whether reading or writing or whatever. Identity. The Muslims, when they were in Mecca with the Prophet, they did not wear special clothes. No, they were like everybody else, normal Arab clothes, but they had their identity. So you as a Muslim have to search deep down inside of you. Am I proud of being who I am? Am I proud of my identity? or not, let alone doing good deeds, let alone giving da'wah. So this is part of your obligations living in the West, to give da'wah, to do righteous deeds. Righteous deeds can be helping in the community when it's halal and there is nothing haram to be performed. All of these things are part of your identity. Now, part of living in the West is to have your priorities set correctly. Are you Deutsch or a Muslim? What comes first? Everybody in Europe, in America, elsewhere, they want you to be nationalists before you're a Muslim. So they say to you, no, you have to become British, then Muslim. Your allegiance to America should become more important to you than your allegiance to Islam. We say this is a no-brainer. I am a Muslim before being Saudi, before being Arab, when Islam and my government collide, I'm always at the side of Islam without any strings attached because I'm a Muslim. What was the Prophet, والسلام, a Muslim? When there was conflict between him and his people, he migrated. He would not give any concessions in Islam. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ Say, oh, you disbelievers. لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ I do not worship what you worship. And you are not 
worshiping what I worship. And I'm not going to worship what you're worshiping. This is something that we repeat every sunnah in Fajr and Maghrib and also in our witter prayers. You have your religion and I have mine. There's no compromise, no concessions. Now, having said that, all governments do not approve of this. They say, ah, this is extreme. You are extremist. You have to be in a melting pot. So Muslims, Hindus, Christians, Jews, all have to be nationalists, having their allegiance to the country first, then their religion. Islam does not permit this. Islam says, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي ومحيايا ومماتي لله رب العالمين لا شريك له. Say that my life, say that my prayer, my sacrifice, my life, and my death are all for Allah Azza wa Jal who has no partners. And by that, I was commanded. And I am among the first to embrace and announce my Islam. So, this is what your identity is all about. And this is what you live and die preserving your Islam. Having said that, this does not at all mean that it doesn't mean that you're allowed, you're supposed to stay in a corner of a masjid or of a room, not mix with people, not be active, not socialize. You must avoid everybody, boycott everybody, disregard everybody, look down at everybody. No, 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 no. Your understanding of Islam is wrong. Why is it wrong? Because you're not learning your religion from people of authority. You're not learning your religion from the Quran, the Sunnah, with the understanding of the righteous predecessors according to what the scholars of Islam teach, you're not following Sharia. You're following your whims and desires. You're following your urges. You're following whatever shaitan tells you to do, you do it, thinking that this is part of Islam, which is not. And this is why it is very important while you are in the West to increase your Iman. 13 years the Prophet spent upbringing his companions, uplifting their Iman. So how can I uplift my Iman, Sheikh? We live in a society that nudity is everywhere. Alcohol and wine and whiskey is everywhere. The, the, the Netherlands is notorious for legalizing marijuana. You want to have brownies and cookies? We have it. You can get stoned legally in marijuana. Everybody in Europe knows Amsterdam, knows the Red District, knows everything. So how can we live in such a society, Sheikh? Well, this is your test. Very easy. You have to increase and focus on your Iman. How? Everybody knows according to the Aqeedah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, Iman increases with good deeds and decreases with sins. So focus on doing good deeds and focus on reducing your sins. How to do this, Sheikh? It's difficult. Ah, here is where you have to build a community. The Muslims cannot live like lone wolves. They have to live in communities in packs. So there has to be cooperation. Why? I have my Quran, I have my Sunnah, I study my religion and I have lectures to listen to. Why do I need Muslims? Because the Prophet said to you, alayhi salatu wasalam, that the wolf only attacks a stray sheep. And Satan is like this. When you are with the congregation, 
Satan cannot attack you. When you leave, the wolf does not attack the herd. Waits until one sheep says, I'm fed up. I need my space. What is this? I don't want to be with people. I need time to contemplate. So I'm going to wander out of the herd for a while just to get a breather. This is when it's gone and it's killed by the wolf who's waiting for it. So many Muslims are being anticipated and waited for by the devil in the same fashion. So to increase your iman, you need to be with a community. But unfortunately, we don't have this. Look at the Muslims in Europe. Do they have one Islamic center to refer to? No. Do they have one imam? No. What do they have? They have in the Netherlands, I've been there, masjids for the Moroccans, masjids for the Turks, masjid for other denom denominations, masjid for Arabs and Egyptian or Palestinian. If you go to the Egyptian and Palestinian masjids, all what you hear in the lectures and the khutbah, slandering and cursing the Muslim rulers, politics, things that kill your heart. I am in Europe. Why are you talking to me about things happening in Saudi or in Egypt or in, in Jordan or in Syria? Talk to me about what uplifts my Iman. Teach me about Tawheed. Show me how to pray. Increase my Iman so that I don't lie or cheat. Remind me of being kind to my parents and my kinship so that I can connect to them. This is what drives me cl closer to Allah. Not talking to me about the Arab Spring, about revolutions, about this, about all of this is nonsense. If you go to the Turk masjid, I don't speak Turkish, but probably it will be only Hanafi teachings and strict Hanafi teachings. And I don't know the topics. And if you go to the Moroccan masjid, also there is not a lot of emphasis on what benefits the people. And they're all divided. Can't we come together, put our hands together so that the West, the disbelievers, see a united front? Most likely no. Why? Because I'm the Imam of the Masjid. If I put my hands with others, my people would probably slip and go to them. I want dominance. I want control. Not all Imams are like this. But there are Imams who take their position as a means of income, as a role of authority to control the congregation. So we need cooperation between the Muslims. We need the Muslims, businessmen, and professors, and workers, engineers, doctors, to come together so that we can build Islamic schools for our children, to preserve their identity, to teach them Arabic, to teach them the Quran, instead of going to public schools and doing all haram things. They have to mix with the opposite gender. They have to swim with the opposite gender, wearing bikinis and maybe one, no, not, not necessarily bikini, but one uh, piece swimming suit, boys and girls. They have to mix in sports, the gymnastics, in everything. What, what kind of Islam is this? Therefore, you as Muslims in the West, find many things that goes that go against Islam. What to do? We can't live like we live in Arabia. Halal is halal, haram is haram. So many times we are faced with things that are like a crossroad. Either go right or left. There's no way other than that. So what to do? An eye-opener. We have the concept of mafasid 
and masalih. We have pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages. Everything you do in Islam, it looks at the advantages and the disadvantages. So whenever the disadvantages outweigh, immediately you abandon it. And if it's the opposite, then you follow it. So if I have to go to school, this is an advantage. But by going to school, I have to take off my hijab. I have to wear a swimming suit. I have to be half naked. I have to mix with the opposite gender. Not only that, do heinous things. The advantages are way less than the disadvantages. What to do? Run. You can't say, what can I do? I am oppressed. I'm forced. Allah says in the Quran about those men, women, and children who were oppressed. The angels at the time of death come to them and says, why didn't you worship Allah? They say, we were oppressed. We could not leave. They just say, wasn't Allah's land so open and vast for you to migrate anyway? And they punish them. And they take them to hell, to the torment of Allah Azza wa Jal, because they did not migrate. So you have to weigh the pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages, to evaluate which direction to take, because there are so many haram things around us. And there are so many things that we cannot find a way out. Sheikh, I live in Holland. And I have to work to feed myself and my family. So I got a job. But the problem is on Friday, it's a full working day. And I tried to ask them to give me permission to go for Juma. They refused. I said, I will compensate you two hours later after or before any working day. They refused. So should I resign? And if you resign, what will you do? Beg? Live on benefits? No. Continue to work. Pray dhuhr on time. And you're exempted from Friday. Because your livelihood and your risk and your job is one of the reasons that scholars said that you can compromise when it conflicts with Juma. Like someone having goods to sell, merchandise, and if he goes to pray to Juma, someone will steal it. So can he skip Juma? The answer is yes, because this is a legitimate reason. What I wanted to say, and I think I will conclude by this, because as I said, the topic is very vast and long and so many areas to talk about. But inshallah, this is more than sufficient to give you an understanding and an eye opener. And maybe you will have some questions that we can um, elaborate a little bit more. What is needed for you to do is to bring the community together. And bringing the community together does not take place by sectarism, by introducing, oh, I'm a Salafi, you're not a Salafi. So you are below me, I'm better than you. I follow the Salaf, I follow the Prophet You follow schools of thought, you're this, you're that. This does not bring anyone closer to anyone. Okay, Sheikh, then you're not Salafi? I never go around hanging a tag on my chest saying, Asim as Salafi. I'm a Muslim. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we know, Sheikh, you're a Muslim. We're all Muslims. What, what kind of a Muslim are you? Why would you not want to know? I'm a Muslim. No, no, we have Sunni, Shi'i. Okay, I'm a Sunni. What kind of a Sunni? I am from Ahl Sunnati Wal Jama'ah. Oh, also, uh, uh, some Ash'aris consider themselves Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'ah. Why would I need to explain and boast about it everywhere? 
I'm a Muslim. You're a Muslim. If you see something wrong, correct me. And if I see something wrong on you, I will tell you that this is not according to the Sunnah. Your belief is not according to Aqidah. Allah says in the Quran, so and so. The Prophet says, says so and so. Alayhi salatu salam. But without carrying a flag and saying, I'm a Salafi. Because such labeling would probably cause more harm than benefit. Especially in the West. The moment anyone hears the word Salafi, they label them as Wahhabis, extremists, terrorists, maybe an ISIS wannabe, which is not very healthy. So even Sheikh Ibn Afaymin, may Allah have mercy on so says, don't say about yourself that I'm a Salafi. Because this is a form of sectarianism. Is as if you're taking a party. He's a Salafi, and this one is Ikhwan, and this one is Tabligh, and this one is this. Everybody is happy with the label. What are you? I'm from Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Who are they? They're anyone who follows the Quran and the Sunnah with the understanding of the righteous three generations that the Prophet praised. But no Salafi, no Athari, no such a thing. This brings the people together. And don't blame others. Don't point fingers. Oh, you do this, you do that, you do this, you do that. Nobody likes criticism. Try to gather the Muslims. Try to bring them together. Try to educate them. Try to care for the Muslim community and to help one another and to uplift the ignorance about religion and to abandon politics because this is what divides people. Turkish don't like Egyptians. Egyptians don't like Saudis. Saudis don't like Yemenis. Yemenis. What is this? This segregates us, separates us. All of us are Muslims. You say, la ilaha illallah, you're closer to me than my own brother because you believe in Allah Azza wa Jal and you're committed to Islam. So I hope, again, I apologize. This is not a proper lecture, but it's just a reminder, chit-chatting, and uh, uh, spending our time um, opening our eyes, trying to understand our religion a little bit better. And hopefully, we will be able to elaborate a little bit more when your questions, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Wallahu a'lam. ونسبة العلم إليه أسلم صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد بارك الله فيك شيخ حاسم for your uh, lecture much. so um, I will tell the people in the Dutch uh, to the Dutch audience what we're going to do and then uh, we'll proceed dus uh, jongens uh, bedankt ja, voor het luisteren bij deze uh, ja, bij, bij de lezing uh, we gaan nu zeg maar overstappen naar de, naar de vragen die jullie hebben ingestuurd Um, ik heb in totaal acht vragen, uh, heb ik, uh, had ik al aan het begin gezegd dat die hadden gefilterd, maar vraag zes is al beantwoord over Jumwa. Dus um, ja, we gaan beginnen met de eerste vraag. Uh, we will start with the first question, inshallah. Okay. So the first question is, um, when we try to become practicing Muslims, we want to follow the path of the Salaf and we want to imitate the Prophet Muhammad wassalam, in his sunnah. No, Hmm. And whenever we try to do this, our parents and people in our environments call us different labels like extremists, Wahhabis, terrorists. How can we deal with this and how can we advise them? Well, welcome to the club. When the Prophet ﷺ came with his message, what did his people say? Liar, sorcerer. Magician, poet, priest, insane. All of these were labels given to the Prophet. ﷺ. Did it stop him from continuing his da'wah? Never. Did it deter him? Did it slow him down? Never. This is our fuel. When people clap to us, And say, oh, Sheikh Asim, you are okay, mashallah. When the Jews, the Christians, the Buddhists, the Hindus say, 
Sheikh Asim is, oh, mashallah, he's very intelligent, very good. Mashallah, his words are very nice. I raise flags and I look in the mirror and say, what wrong am I doing? Because Allah stated in the Quran, وَلَن تَرْضَى عَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَن نَصَارَ حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتَهُمْ The Jews and the Christians will never be pleased with you until you follow their ways. I remember, I think, seven years ago, Sheikh Haytham Al-Haddad came to Amsterdam and I saw a clip where he was giving a lecture to the Muslims, but it was an open lecture. And then came this woman, Kafir woman, insisting to sit with him on the same table, to shake hands with him, and forcing her way on the Muslims. And the Sheikh was very diplomatic. He says, He did not look at her. He, he tried his level best. Now, what did she want? She wanted to break the Muslims. She wanted to break him. So do you think if he shook hands with her, she would be happy and go her way? No. Unless you do exactly what they want, such as unless you take off your Islamic dress. If you're a Muslim, take off your hijab, your niqab, expose your body. If you're a man, Mix with them, drink with them, eat pork. And never mention anything about Islam or Allah or the Quran. They hate Quran. Khert Wilders. They hate anything that has to do with Islam. And what kills them most, the issue of shaking hands. And this kills me. Seriously, because they want to force us accept their ways. And I always, you know, I, I'm rude. I'm, I'm, I'm an old, arrogant Saudi sheikh. Again, what can you do? Sue me. You can't. People, you will usually say, no, you discriminate women. And you, you look down upon them. Why don't you shake hands with women? Duh. Why would I shake hands with women? Because this is human. You have to treat them like humans. I said, is shaking hands treating them like humans? She says, yes. What about if I want to kiss her on the cheek? Because this is human. She said, no. What about if I like to touch her body in certain areas? just to make sure that she's human. This is inappropriate. This is disgusting. Said, in your culture, it's disgusting. Maybe in my culture, it's okay. No, 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 no. Would you have to say, shake hands? This is the, the, the least you can do. This is the least I can do in your understanding, not in mine. If I were to tell you, if you want me to shake hands with you, wear a thunk, and give me a lap dance. <gasps> this is outrageous. How dare you speak like this? That's, she was doing that. It just came. Why are you offended? This is how we feel when you force yourselves onto us. If I am lactose intolerant, and you give me a glass of milk and say, drink it, and I said, sorry, I'm lactose intolerant. What would you do? You would be considered and say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No problem. Or would you shove it down my throat? Of course not. You will understand. Why? Because it's harmful for me, medically and physically. Now, if I tell you that shaking hands with the opposite gender is offensive and harmful for me, on the day of judgment because it will throw me in hell why don't you accept this because you don't want to accept this your issue is not with touching my silky hands and feeling the warmth of my body your problem is with my religion 
Your problem is with my conviction. And this is why we have to stand our grounds. Family members, relatives, people calling us names. So what? The Prophet was called names, Ali Sassam. So everyone has a test. And this is your test in Islam. You could have been tested, and people say, yeah, but this is very difficult, Sheikh. This test is very horrible. I said, how much would you grade it out of 100? They say, oh, Sheikh, it's very difficult. The pressure we're getting, it's like 90% hardship. I said, okay, compare it to other tests. Would you like to have colon cancer or ovarian or breast cancer with the chemotherapy, radiation, and the whole nine yards? No, no. Well, who who would, would like that? If you were to be tested with that, how much would you grade it? They said, oh, that would be 100%. And what about your test with such people labeling you as Wahhabi or extremist? Oh, no, no, that is way less. It's mm, 80%. Your parents are alive. I said, yes, alhamdulillah. What's your rating of losing one of them? Oh, Sheikh, that's 110. I cannot bear the idea of losing my mom or my father. Okay, what about your calamity of being labeled? Said, oh, no, that's 70, maybe 65. We can go on and on and on mentioning different tests only to find that what you're suffering from, what you're facing with the community, with your relatives, with loved ones, your parents, accusing you of being extremist, is nothing. Let them bark. Let them say whatever they say. Am I pleasing Allah or not? Yes or no? Yes. Is Allah happy with what I'm doing? Is Allah pleased with what I'm doing? Definitely. Khalas, who cares? And Allah knows best. Um, we will go to the uh, second uh, question, inshallah. The second question is, uh, why do people think that if you read Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, rahimullah, his books, that you are misguided? Uh, that's the third question. What about the second? Well, the second uh, was about innovation, but you already uh, answered it. In uh, Okay, the good. So why would anyone consider reading the books of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab a misguidance? Very simple. You are ignorant of what you don't know. So if you ask anyone who tells you, ah, you've studied the books of Muhammad and Abdul Wahab, you're misguided. Say to them, I can agree with that on one condition. Tell me, where is the misguidance in his books? He will tell you, ah, oh, because you will become extremist, you will become a fundamentalist, you will become a jihadi, you will kill people, you will give takfir to people. How do you know that? The I heard people say that. MashaAllah. Have you ever read any of his books? No, I don't have to. People talk. Excuse me. Have you or haven't you? Sorry, I haven't then how can you judge me who have read his books, learned a lot of them, just based on what people say? This is total ignorance. So you don't have to respond to ignorant people. When people come and say to your face, and by the way, they, came, they used to come to me and say this a lot, especially haters, when they say, oh, Sheikh Hassan, you're an ass. Should I be angry? No. I say, I say to them, true, this is my name, ass, I am. This is how they spell my name, ass, I am. So when people come and say, you're an ass, does this mean I'm going to grow two ears and a tail? No. Let them say whatever they want. Good people say good words. Bad people say bad words. I'm not going to be affected by that. So those who criticize, those who speak ill, 
about the books of Imam Muhammad and Abdul Wahab are one of two. Either a deviant Shia or a deviant Sufi. There's no third. Why? Because the books of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab speak about Aqidah, about returning people to Sunnah, about purifying our beliefs from innovations. And this is what the Shia and the Sufis thrive on. This is how they live. And they cannot keep their congregation, their followers. They cannot use them and buy them and utilize what they have if they started to read the books of Muhammad and Abdul Hab, which basically are Quran and Sunnah with the understanding of the Salaf. So I hope this answers your question. Do you still have time for a few questions? Yeah, well, the night is young. <laughs> okay. So the, the, the next question is, um, are there differences in Aqidah within Athari? I, I think he believes within the Athari Aqidah. There are claims that athari, that the athari, uh, athari Aqidah of today is not the same as the Aqidah back in the time of Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Rahimullah, Imam Malik, Rahimullah, and so on. This issue of difference of opinion in Aqidah matters is a very sensitive and delicate issue. So people say, did the companions differ on issues of Aqidah? The vast majority say they did not. Because when you speak about Aqidah, the first thing that comes up to people's minds are the essential differences today. Whether the attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal, like the Ash'aris, believe in are limited to seven attributes of Allah and everything else is not which is definitely wacko all these attributes mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah the Ash'aris come and say no this is not what it is meant this is metaphoric this is this this is that which totally change is the Aqidah so when you say that companions differ in issues of Aqidah our Salafi people immediately grow up horns and want to attack, thinking that we're talking about Ash'ari or Mu'tazili or Khawarij or Qadari or Murji'ah. All of these, the companions differed in. No, 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 definitely not. The companions had never, ever had any issues of this. When you come down a little bit, then you start to have these issues coming up. But what is the use of it? Only to preoccupy you in argument and debates that have zero benefit to you or to Islam or to the Muslims. The issues of Aqidah that the, the Athari or the Salafi people have differed over are negligible. And they're not in fundamental issues, like in Tawheed, like in the beautiful names and attributes of Allah, like in belief in Qadar or belief in the Yawm Al-Akhir or the six pillars of Islam in general. No, no, no. no. They differed whether the dead can hear you or not. They differed in issues that are similar to that, but not of great importance. So to come today and try to make an issue out of it or to occupy Muslims by asking questions that are irrelevant, I would definitely ignore and move on because this is not helpful at all and there is no use of it. Yeah, why? go into, eh, the Salafi is different, the Athari is different in issues of Aqidah, blah, blah, blah. Who cares? Follow the Quran and the Sunnah with the understanding of the righteous predecessors to the best of your ability. And if there is a difference of opinion over whether, yani for example, seven on the Day of Judgment are shaded in the shade of Allah, where there is no shade other than the shade of Allah. 
does Allah have a shade? Some scholars say, no, this is metaphoric among the Salafi movement because this may imp uh, 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 insinuate that there is light that Allah gives shades to blah, blah, blah. And some say, no, this is like the attributes of Allah. We have to believe in it as it is. So others say, no, 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 no. It's not the shade of Allah. It's a shade of the throne of Allah. It's a shade that Allah creates and not his shade. This is trivial in a sense issue to compare it to the difference between our Aqidah and the Aqidah of Ash'aris or Mu'tazila or Jahmiya or Qadariya or Murjia, etc. So don't preoccupy people with such things and follow the Quran and Sunnah with the understanding of the righteous predecessors. Jazakallah um, khairan. The next question is, um, it's not about Aqidah. Um, it says, uh, you know, here in the West, the people are getting lessons about homosexuality and even to children. What should we as Muslims do to protect our children? I don't know about Holland. I know that in UK, you can do homeschooling. In the US, you can do homeschooling. So you get your children, put them in an Islamic school. If this is not possible because it's too expensive or you don't have anyone to teach in that Islamic schools, you take them home and you teach them and at the end of the year, you, they give exams. So you avoid such free mixing, you avoid such haram things. I know in the Scandinavian countries, to my knowledge, I might be wrong, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, uh, etc., that you cannot do homeschooling. You're forced to do this. And this is very bad. When my eight-year-old daughter or son are given sex education on the use of contraceptives, on the types of sex toys, on how to put a condom on a dildo, on how to refuse intimacy if the, girls, if the girl says no. And the boy is eight years old and he sees these things. This is very dangerous if not going to practice it, the least he's going to investigate, maybe with his sister, maybe with his mother, maybe in the internet, maybe he goes to the red district and who knows what happens there. So this is very dangerous. We have to protect our children with all what we have, but it depends on the resources and the means available, whether you have Muslim schools or not. If not, then you have to start planning to build a masjid, a school, many schools to incubate and to take in our children, inshallah. Barakallahu Fik. Um, the next question, um, it says, how can you have an, ex an Islamic wedding when both parents of the bride and groom aren't practicing Islam and have a Western way of thinking? Uh, and then it says music and culture. Put your foot at the door. Don't close the door. Put your foot. Tell them that I'm not having an un-Islamic wedding. I'm getting married. I'm taking my wife. You guys want to have a wedding with music. You pay for it. I will not attend it. I will not come. Let them bang their head on the wall. Let them do whatever they want. Be a man. Being a dutiful, respectful son doesn't mean that you become a doormat where they wipe their feet whenever they come and go. This is a misconception that obeying the parents is a must in everything. This is totally wrong. If your parents say, shave your beard, or we will never talk to you until the day of judgment. Would you? No. Okay, they will not talk to me, Sheikh. They are the wrong doers. They are the oppressors, not you. You're following Allah's law. Do you want me to tell me that it's allowed to break Allah's law to please them? No, it's not. 
If your father comes and says, stand on one leg for one hour. I said, why, father? He says, because I said so. Simon says, you're not obliged to obey him. Sit down. He said, you're disobeying me. You're not asking me to do something that's beneficial for you, nor something that's logical. Why would I obey you? If your father says, give me all of your savings in the bank. How much do you have? I said, I have 100,000 euros. Give it all to me. Why, father? Because I said, I saw. I will not give him one real, one penny, one euro. If he's in need, really in need, I will give him some. But I will not harm myself just to please him. So you have to put this in perspective. They want you to do haram wedding. I'm not coming. It's my wedding. Either we do it my way or the highway. And this would go very easily, especially when you have a good woman who thinks like you and sees eye to eye over these things. Allah knows best. Uh, the last question: uh, How to deal with how how to deal with liberal Muslims who support haram? They are sinners, and they are one of two. Either they are misguided, but they're good people. Or they are full-fledged hypocrites that want to disseminate Islam, to destroy it, and to attack it. If they are ignorant, good people, we have to give them da'wah. We have to be patient, tolerant. Why? We have to teach them, or we have to treat them like a doctor treating a patient. So no matter what offensive things they say or bad way they deal with us, we treat them as they're sick and we want the good for them. Unlike the hip, full-fledged hypocrites, enemies of Islam, people who want to destroy and harm Islam and the Muslims, these are our enemies. How to deal with them? Boycott them. Ignore them like roaches, like flies. When they come to speak to you, I'll try to put their whispers and venom in your system. Ignore them. Don't pay attention to them. So that they don't come over and over. Even if they were relatives, boycott them because they're enemies of Islam. These people, you have to focus and invest your time and wealth and knowledge to try to pull them back to Islam. Jazakallah uh, khair. We have finished the questions, the eight questions, or the seven questions, actually. Um, so I, I think... think uh, yes. I, I think I will conclude this uh, this lecture, Sheikh. Yes. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh, for your time. Barakallah uh, it, it was a nice uh, lecture and uh, a beautiful uh, reminder. And alhamdulillah, uh, I hope we can see you uh, next time, inshallah. And uh, I will thank you for your time, uh, Sheikh. I will uh, thank the moderators for their uh, efforts. And I, will, uh, I want to thank uh, the listeners for their, uh, for, uh, yani, to benefit from, uh, from, your, uh, from your lecture. And um, I think it was it. Barakallah fikum. Jazakumullah khair for having me. And I pray for all the brothers and sisters in Holland and sorry, the Netherlands as they change. I always know it as Holland, but they decided to change the name. So, so I can, I, I pray for them that they remain steadfast on Islam. I pray to them that Allah saves them and keep them in good health, security, and to be able to spread Islam, not only by rhetoric, but by their moral conduct, by their akhlaq, by their good behavior, by excelling in their studies and in their jobs and not living on the benefits of the state like a lot of, unfortunately, people do. I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal would make Holland a good place to live in and that I will be visiting it soon, inshallah. عز وجل والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته
وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته